This brief video is a response to Tholius, a viewer who asked a question about the first practice example near the end of the heart murmurs lecture. Tholius wanted to know how to tell that the example murmur was systolic or diastolic. Uh, so here's the example. It is from a 60-year-old man presenting with shortness of breath, and this murmur is best heard at the apex. To identify what is the most likely etiology of this murmur, the first step is to determine whether it's systolic or diastolic. However, this example is actually a little tricky because there is an extra sound thrown in. In retrospect, this uh, first example probably should have been more straightforward, um, so I apologize for that. Um, but here is a schematic of a phonocardiogram, uh, which is a visual representation of cardiac auscultation. The horizontal axis represents time where for this particular example, each hash mark will represent 200 milliseconds. The vertical line represents relative intensity. When I listen to this murmur, uh, the murmur itself is actually the first thing that stands out to me so instead of the heart sounds. So let's start with that. Listen to see whether the murmur is present for longer than 50% of the cardiac cycle, in which case it's likely to be diastolic or if it lasts shorter than 50% of the cardiac cycle, in which case it's probably systolic. One way to do this is to place your hand down on the desk when the murmur is present, and then lift it off when the murmur is gone. Uh, after doing this for a few cycles, you may start to get a sense whether or not your hand spends more time on the desk or in the air. So why don't you give that a try? This pink box will represent the murmur. It lasts about 400 milliseconds. Uh, don't worry, there's no way your ear will be able to determine that specific duration, but I have uh, audio recording software that allows me to measure it directly. And then the next cycle occurs about 1.3 seconds after the first one begins. Again, I've measured it exactly, so don't expect to be able to estimate it by ear per se. From the picture, you can see that the murmur lasts for less than half the cardiac cycle. Uh, therefore, it is systolic. What makes this example difficult is not the murmur itself, but rather the heart sounds placed around the murmur that can kind of muddle how long the murmur is actually lasting for. So again, when I listen, I uh, predominantly hear the, the murmur first, and then after that, I could probably identify two sounds relatively quickly, one occurring right at the end of the murmur here, and another one slightly softer um, occurring shortly afterwards. Take another listen. If you're paying really close attention, there's actually one final heart sound that comes right at the beginning of the murmur, which your brain kind of loses because it's focusing on the murmur that comes right afterwards. So what are these sounds? Uh, you might be able to tell just from the picture, but the more easily identifiable sounds are actually S2 and an S3, and it's the S1 that gets a little bit lost by the murmur. So uh, listen again. In uh, Tholius's question, uh, he raised the issue um, about whether or not the word Kentucky uh, can be used to check the cadence of an extra sound to determine if it's an S3 or S4. Um, how that works is if the cadence of sounds matches the cadence of the word Kentucky, this suggests an S3 is present. Uh, this is a frequently taught technique, which I think works pretty well here. Uh, some will also use the word Tennessee to identify an S4. Maybe I say Tennessee strangely, but I personally don't find that quite as helpful as the Kentucky trick. Um, let's take, actually take away the S3, uh, and here's the difference at that point. Uh, the murmur will probably be easier to identify as systolic without the S3. And let's add the S3 back in again. Finally, let's listen to the recording slow down to one half speed. Uh, listen for the S1, S2, and S3, 
along with the fact that the murmur is nestled between S1 and, and S2, um, and that there's actually a gap uh, in sound between S2 and S3. And there's a little bit of reverberation, I think, of the S3, which, um, again, it adds to the trickiness of the example. So overall, uh, this is an example of a mitral regurgitation with a whole systolic murmur and an S3 thrown in suggestive of the fact the patient probably has developed uh, congestive heart failure as a consequence. So Tholius, thanks for bringing the great questions and I hope this helps to clarify things.